Okay. Uh, what the topic for today then uh, is uh, dissociation. And this is an important topic in cultural psychiatry. I mentioned last time that somatization was a very core topic and it goes back to the very beginnings of people's interest in cultural differences because bodily expressions of distress are probably the most common expressions of distress around the world if you just take that broad category of uh, expressing suffering in some kind of physical bodily way, experiencing and expressing it in that, that way. Similarly, dissociative experiences, uh, which I'll describe in a moment, are extraordinarily common. Uh, they are particularly common in settings outside uh, Northern Europe and uh, North America. So we have, again, a bit of a skew in the sense that the way that we frame dissociative phenomena comes out of uh, studies and reflections in contexts where they have been less common than they are elsewhere. And there's some consequences of that. So this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, actually, I, I'm not going to follow precisely this outline, but I'm going to talk about uh, how, what we mean by dissociation, how we think about it, what the place is of dissociation in psychiatry, the link to culture-bound syndromes I'll mention briefly because we introduced that at the beginning of, of the course, um, and then uh, some ways of thinking about the varieties of dissociative phenomena and how they link to uh, basic processes of memory and perception, uh, how they link to our narrative construction of the self, that is, the extent to which who we are is our own self-awareness, but also a story we tell about ourselves. Uh, it's not just I and me and I sense a lot of things right now and I'm sort of grounded in that phenomenal reality. I am also this particular person with a name and a biography and I remember what happened yesterday and so on. So we're always constructing a kind of a story based on uh, memories and based on um, uh, social roles we play. And it's the weaving together of that story that makes the coherence of our self and our identity because we have lots of different experiences, but we weave them together. Certain ones we cast off as irrelevant. Uh, you know, I was just uh, intoxicated when that happened, so it doesn't really count. And, uh, you know, that's when I was waking up from being half asleep. That doesn't really count. But there's certain other ones that really count for who I am and who I want to be and how I portray myself. So I'm going to argue that that process of weaving together a coherent narrative about the self is central to understanding dissociative processes because it's precisely either when that breaks down or when that very mode of narration includes the possibility of another kind of self, of another center of agency, another way of being, that we create the possibility of certain kinds of dissociation. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the social and cultural meanings of dissociation. Now, I, I'm probably not going to do this in a very linear fashion uh, because I want to build it around certain examples. But the first point to be made is that given the fact that the way in which dissociation came to be present in psychiatry was through clinical encounters, initially in the context of the sort of early um, neuropsychiatry uh, where people came to psychiatric attention because they were having pseudo-neurological symptoms. I mentioned this last time in talking about somatization. And the film we saw, really, of a woman who was having paralyses and so on would count as that kind of symptom, uh, as a kind of apparent loss of motor control or sensory alteration or, uh, and so on. But this is how this came to be, these phenomena came to be present within psychiatry. So from the beginning, they were pathologized, right? The dissociation or whatever might be accounting for this kind of loss of function, change of identity, and so on, I'll describe in a moment, was viewed in pathological terms, also viewed in primitive terms. We'll talk about this in a moment. The word dissociation serves as the name of a set of phenomena and an assumption or about the underlying mechanism. So the same word is referring to certain phenomena, behaviors, and to the idea that there's a mechanism underlying that. So dissociative behaviors and dissociation as a mechanism. So that's a bit of a confusion here because each is making different assumptions. Um, and uh, that mechanism of dissociation and the behaviors that go with it were assumed from early on to again be in some sense primitive, to be childlike, to be more common in those human beings who are viewed in some way as developmentally or psychologically or culturally primitive whether it's people in other places, or whether it's less educated people within society, or whether it's women compared to men, a whole lot of distinctions kind of made that carried that kind of value judgment and that um, hierarchy. 
At the same time, a way that dissociative phenomena appeared very prominently within psychiatry was in association with traumatic events, initially, notably, war neuroses. Uh, so war trauma, so situations where uh, people were exposed to a, a horrible event and they suddenly became blind. But there was nothing obviously wrong with their visual system. So how do you explain this apparent blindness or this apparent paralysis? And so these were understood as hysterical conversion symptoms, a kind of uh, neurotic symptom, and classified or subclassified conversion is understood as something that maybe involves dissociation. Um, in the early development of psychoanalysis, one thing that happened was at some point there was a shift from an interest in these conversion symptoms and dissociative symptoms toward att more attention to things that involve uh, psychological overt, more or less overt, or uh, um, uh, discoverable processes of conflict, of psychological conflict. And in particular, uh, there was a process early on where people were recounting traumatic experiences as a possible cause of the kind of hysterical paralysis or other symptoms that they had, and Freud decided that these symptoms were perhaps not due to actual traumas people had experienced, because some of the stories of trauma he heard he found hard to credit, uh, but were related to conflicts that they had. And so there was a shift away from dissociative phenomena. Early on, Freud having trained uh, 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 with uh, Charcot and, and uh, as a neurologist in the, that time period uh, where people were seeing lots of conversion symptoms as these physical symptoms, loss of fun motor function, loss of sensory function, for which no physical injury could be found, was using hypnosis, among other things, to try to help people, to cure people. Uh, and it was effective in some cases, but then he felt sometimes the symptoms came back, and he came to feel that this was not getting to the root of the problem, that the root of the problem was psychological conflict. And so the whole notion of dissociation got pushed aside or viewed just as a particularly pathological kind of defense mechanism uh, and of not, not uh, as of such interest in its own right. And the attention to these dissociative phenomena and a view of them, a different view of them, which had already existed around the time of Freud in the writings of Pierre Janet and others, uh, came back into popularity in the 60s and 70s and 80s, along with a huge amount of interest in the wide prevalence of child abuse and other kinds of uh, uh, psychological trauma. So that's a bit of the backdrop uh, in terms of psychiatry itself, and I'll, I'll come back to this history a little bit uh, later on. I wanted to underscore the importance of dissociative phenomena in terms of this discussion around cultural difference and around um, some of the uh, iconic kinds of ideas and, and images of, of, of disorders in cultural psychiatry. And so this is the list that I showed earlier of the culture-bound syndromes that are presented in the appendix to dsm 4 and these are the ones for which dissociation has been proposed as really being quite central uh, to the symptoms and to the experiences people have. At one point in the uh, processes of considering culture in dsm 4 there was an invitation from the group working on dissociative disorders to try to put maybe most of the culture-bound syndromes in that context, uh, and I think this was partly a a, a, a great uh, uh, land grab possibility that uh, had all the culture down syndromes been put under dissociative disorders, it would become the largest category, uh, globally speaking anyway, in, in, uh, in the DSM. But if you look uh, more closely at some of these uh, things, as I mentioned last time, not all of them are syndromes, but the ones I listed there could be described as having a strong uh, dissociative component. And I'll try to explain more what that means in a, in, in a moment again. Um, if you look at it in terms of the broad groupings that uh, uh, Ron Simons and Charles Hughes proposed, then at least the sudden mass assault syndromes, where if someone goes off brooding and then uh, explodes into violence and kills a lot of people and then says they don't remember anything. It's that not remembering anything that makes it clearly dissociative. So there seems to be amnesia for this behavior. It's complex behavior in the sense that somebody's running around killing people and it takes a certain amount of organization to do that, uh, but then they're claiming they don't remember at all. Uh, 
I've, we mentioned the other running syndromes. I talked to you about Pabloktok last time, trying to explore a little bit the myth of that, but there are other syndromes also. And I, I should have mentioned last time when I was talking about Pabloktok that the closest that uh, the historian Lyle Dick could find to the actual term uh, was a, a Greenlandic uh, Inuit term uh, that doesn't sound quite like that, but that meant drum dance trance in effect. What ha the state that people get in when they're doing shamanic drumming. So it does sound like then there would be a link to kind of what we're going to talk about as dissociation. And then the most obvious connect, uh, category that connects to this out and out is this notion of spirit possession. Uh, so we can think about uh, trance and possession uh, as uh, a variety of phenomena. Trance, per se, is usually talked about as an altered state of consciousness. What that means, of course, is another story. Whether that actually puts a label on it, whether it explains anything, is another story. But originally, I think it was on the notion that, well, we have different states of consciousness. We have being alert and awake. We have being drowsy. We have being asleep. Uh, we have being intoxicated, I guess we could call a state of consciousness in a way, although we're starting to get into a whole other kind of uh, process. And then maybe we can put things like being in a trance on that. And there was some assumption that maybe there were some continua uh, we don't know what, what the dimensions are in terms of being drowsy, being awake. We know there's a sort of arousal continuum, but what continuum should trance be put on or what continuum should intoxication be put on? It's not clear that this is one single dimension anymore, that you're affecting different systems uh, in, in complex ways, so we don't know what, how many dimensions should there be to this kind of space in which we're going to locate different kinds of states. So that's one of the problems with using the state term because there's an assumption somehow that you've got um, a continuum, or you've got discrete states you can describe, and both of those are, are difficult to do. Um, at the same time as we have these alterations in consciousness and in experience, uh, we also have alterations in how people attribute behavior. So I can say that uh, I just don't remember anything, uh, or that I wasn't in control of myself, I was being controlled by someone else. It was a, a god that possessed me, let's say. Uh, and I could do that with or without having a different experience. So the attributional process is at least conceptually separate from the experiential process. Um, and in particular, there's this notion that people may experience themselves as not being in control. So then you have a fusion in some ways between this attributional process and the experiential process. And to understand that better, we need to understand what does it mean to experience agency? What does it mean that I feel that I have control over some of my actions? and other ones I don't. Um, I'm going to skip this and going to come back to it. So I wanted to give you some images so that we, because I've been talking around this and each of you have been drawing on whatever your own fund of experiences is, and some of you uh, have seen lots of these kinds of things, some of you may not have seen lots of these kinds of things, so I'm going to just show you a few different kinds of images to kind of, you know, so we have some examples, and feel free to bring up your own examples as we go along. So this is uh, an image from Kuala Lumpur, uh, from a, uh, a, an annual ceremony called uh, Tai Pusam. And this is a ceremony where the Tamil community uh, in that area uh, uh, honors a god, Murugan, uh, who they've asked for favors from. If you've asked for favors previously in the year, you make a vow that you'll, you'll um, sort of give uh, thanks uh, through putting yourself through various privations. So this is a young boy who has a veil a little uh, pointy kind of shaft stuck through uh, his, uh, his cheek. He also has all these things, hooks in his, uh, in his chest. People put hooks in their back and they pull little floats with uh, flowers and so on. And people prepare uh, for this sometimes for several days. They may go to um, um, a, a teacher, to a guru or whatever who helps them prepare for this and then they take part in these things and they're big public celebrations. Uh, this is an image from Bali, from Indonesia, where people are taught to perform various arts, dancing and, and so on, uh, and that these are all forms of religious uh, celebration. Uh, and in learning to do these things, you're supposed to uh, get deeply absorbed and yield to, in effect, a spirit that then guides you, uh, so that you are not really consciously dancing, you are uh, you're embodying this, um, this uh, spirit. 
Uh, here's an image from Bali, from an old image. Uh, see if we can play, the, play this okay. And the holy water. And the sky, she is willing to come out of that. Okay. Um, so that incidentally is Margaret Mead narrating that clip. And that's from work that she did with Gregory Bateson in, in Bali in the, um, I guess in the 30s or 40s. Um, and um, what you see kind of in that little uh, clip is a, a, an old woman who's seated on the ground but who's dancing with the top half of her body and who's completely absorbed and then doesn't come out of this state of absorption when she's supposed to. So then the priest is also intervening, trying to help her to come out. So it's this idea again of people being deeply absorbed in something and as though they're away, as though they're not there, as though they're not present and engaged in, in the usual sense. So this is an image from uh, Singapore of a, a Chinese um, uh, uh, shaman, uh, Dan Qi. And I wanted to show you, that's where I was uh, the week before uh, I, um, uh, this course started, uh, why I was jet lagged all last week, although I don't seem to be much less jet lagged today. So in any event, um, so I wanted to show you some images from that visit uh, where we're working with some Don Key. This is a, a, a temple uh, in uh, the middle of an apartment complex. You can see some of the buildings just uh, to one side in a kind of a working class district in, uh, in Singapore. Uh, and this is the image of the, uh, that particular shrine, which is um, a, a tortoise and a serpent. And uh, so this is the shrine up top. Uh, and then uh, this is the area where the consultations occur with the healer. Uh, the other end of that room is a Chinese medicine dispensary. So you have possession and Chinese medicine. And actually, the healer is trying to convince my colleague, Boon Wee Lee, who's a psychologist, to set up practice there so they could have psychotherapy, too. Um, this is the, uh, the uh, Dan Ki, the, the um, uh, person who acts as a kind of spirit medium, who gets possessed by the god, who then does the healing. It's, he's not really the healer. It's the god who's the healer. He's just a vehicle uh, for the god to be able to embody himself. Yeah. So here he is on the left now, starting to get ready, and they're chanting. This chanting went on for about half an hour before he came, and then he sat down, and now he's starting to get more absorbed. So what this process of going into trance, as it were, or getting, actually getting possessed, uh, is um, fairly standard for him. It looks pretty much the same. Other people we saw, there are many similarities, but there are also some variations. And typically, he does a lot of yawning initially. There's newspapers on the floor because eventually he starts retching and throws up uh, repeatedly. So they've got, they're ready to collect the mess kind of when that happens. Although he usually fasts from midday, so there's not much for him to throw up. But I can tell you, I didn't include it here because it's not good for you uh, in, you know, uh, the retching is quite intense. It's quite hard to listen to. It makes me at least quite queasy. Oops. Okay, well, I hope that's the end. I hope that we're just coming to the end of the clip. This is now much later on where he's starting to get really absorbed. And in a moment, you'll see he's going to get, the moment of possession will occur. That's it. So now he's possessed by the God. I mean, this in between those two clips was about half an hour of him being absorbed and, and, and getting involved. And he's possessed by a God that is actually a baby God. Uh, so they're going to put around him in a moment uh, a, a necklace with a pacifier on it, which he'll suck at some points. Uh, there you see the pacifier. And then they're going to give him some insignia and stuff, and he'll go out and he'll go to the upper part of the temple to give his thanks to the, and, uh, the, the bigger gods, because he's a rather lowly god, uh, uh, you know, before he comes back and starts doing the consultations. Oh, 
So he's going out to do that. So this kind of consultation process in which is the God speaking now, not him, and the God uh, has you know, knowledge of what's going on, can diagnose problems, can intervene. This could go on for many, many hours. It depends on how many people have come to see him. Uh, he does this two nights a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, this guy, at this temple. And you take a token and wait uh, to be seen. And he might see, I mean, they literally, as soon as one person's finished, they usher another person in with no wasted time. Uh, and uh, this could go on from 7.30 when it began till 1 or 2 in the morning if there are a lot of people waiting to be seen. Uh, you don't pay the donkey directly. You can make an offering which gets put in a kind of an alms box or whatever, and that's how the congregation keeps going. But uh, you don't pay him directly. It's not a business. It's a calling. It's a spiritual calling that he has uh, to do this. Um, I think I have here... So this is him coming. This is now the evening's over. This is... Uh, this is many hours later, but actually we came a second night, so we only lasted the first half of the first night, we came a second night. So this is another day, but very similar. And uh, he's then, uh, they're sort of, you know, cleaning him off, and then they give him some of his favorite treats. He likes chocolate, because he's a little, little god. So they, uh, they give him some chocolate to eat. I think he likes raisin glossettes and things like that in particular. At one point, I have a close-up of the, his favorite chocolates and stuff. So, so he has his uh, chocolates and some drinks. He's having some sweet drinks now. They're supporting his head because his body is completely limp now since the spirit is leaving him. That was a little high to us. <laughs> so um, that gives you, I think, a more vivid picture of a certain kind of dissociative practice. No. No memory for any of it. Uh, mostly. Uh, they're, uh, different healers have different gods that inhabit them. Uh, more than one, god, one healer may have more than one god, and they may call on different ones depending upon the need. Um, and sometimes you're calling one and another one comes, and that's a bit more complicated, and you have to sort of work that out. Uh, there are different chairs that they have in this temple uh, that have different insignia on them, and that's related to which god, and you would wear a certain costume and so on. So he usually is inhabited by this baby god. And I'm going to show you now another guy who also is usually inhabited by the same god. Uh, it happens that this guy's on Tuesdays and Thursdays, the other guy's on Wednesdays and Fridays, but that's, <laughs> that's, a, but that's no particular arrangement between them, I don't think, because there actually are many, many of these uh, healers, uh, both in Singapore and throughout uh, Malaysia. Uh, usually, in, in his case, uh, his father was a donkey, and then in his uh, teens and twenties, he was uh, a bit of a rake and not so uh, on such a straight path, and then he had a dream in which the god appeared to him, and he realized he had to get more involved. Uh, typically, one will have a dream or an in initiatory illness of some kind, an illness, and you discover in the process that it, the god is demanding that you have to uh, become a, a receptacle. Yes, I, I usually, in this course, I often show a film, I'm not going to show it today, but um, uh, on uh, an in initiation uh, of a Korean shaman, what's called a kut, which is a ceremony to initiate a, a new shaman. And it's a documentary made by Laurel Kendall of a similar kind of socioeconomic setting in the sense of working class uh, temples and folk religion and a person who's trying to become a healer. Uh, and who doesn't succeed. So it's quite interesting because it goes on for half an hour, 45 minutes, documenting her many, many attempts to get possessed and so on, and her uh, lack of success in doing it, which raises really interesting issues. I mean, typically when you read anthropological literature, of course, it's always the best case scenario, the richest, most detailed you know, version of something, because that's what's interesting to write about. But the real life scenario is, is more complicated. And the idea that some people might want to become uh, a healer uh, or a shaman or have a possession experience and would not is I think very interesting for us and, and help, you know, points to trying to think about what are the, the factors and I will say more about that. Yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, so the, the term that they prefer in English is devotee, because they're devotees to the god. They're typically people who've been helped at some point in time and who've gotten more and more involved in this congregation, and they're running the whole thing. At the end of a, a typical consult, during the consultations, they act as interpreters and reinforce his message at times, so the god may be saying certain things that are not clear. The god typically speaks in Hokkien, which is a particular Chinese dialect which not everybody can understand if they themselves are not Hokkien, so he may say things that they don't really understand. So then the interpreters can, or the attendants or the devotees can translate into, um, uh, into Mandarin and whatever and explain to people. Uh, or they may just reinforce the message. You know, he, was tell he told me I had a really stiff neck from too much time from the computer and I had to do certain exercises and so on. So one of the attendants was really showing me and, you know, really uh, getting, getting all the information. I have all this on video, but I won't, uh, <laughs> won't subject you to it. So, um, and uh, at the end of a, a typical evening, they will then come for consultations. Uh, and uh, I should say, as you saw, this is all completely public completely public. It's all public to whoever cares to be in the temple. Uh, there's nothing that's private. The one exception was one of the devotees, when she was consulting, everybody else cleared out of the room. So that was a professional courtesy, I guess, among them, and they knew that she wanted privacy. But in general, this is not something that you do in private. And uh, we'll come back to that. I'm going to talk more today about the dissociative aspects of this, and I will talk in a uh, week after next about healing specifically, and we'll focus in more on what might be going on here that is transformative or not for people and, and how might that work. But today I'm just using these as some vivid examples of what is dissociative behavior. Is there something to explain here or not? And I'll, I'll just anticipate by saying, actually, I, I shouldn't say more because you're going to turn the lights back on. So let me finish because I should be doing this on the camera. So what I'll do is I'll finish showing you the clips and then we can get the lights working again and we'll get back to our good imagery and I'll make the point I want to make. But what I did want to show you now though was another uh, healer, um, uh, uh, whereas this first one is in a fairly elaborate temple uh, in the middle of a big apartment complex, like in a kind of courtyard area facing the apartment. But people come not just from that apartment building, they come from all over Singapore uh, to, for, for healing. This is another uh, equally uh, well-known Don Ki, but it's in his home, in a, in a very small uh, working-class home. Uh, and in fact, strictly speaking, you're not supposed to do that, but he has special dispensation because, as you'll see in a moment, he's, he's uh, quite well-known. This is the shrine inside with all the images of the different gods um, and their helpers. Uh, this is the table where he'll be working, and these are his assistants getting ready. You can see, again, all the talismans waiting to be activated in front, all these pieces of paper. Until they're written on by the donkey, they're, they're nothing. They're just ordinary pieces of paper. Once he's written on them, they're powerful objects now because his mark is a message that this is now uh, you know, to be listened to by the gods. Um, this is his wife, actually, behind a counter. They sell various thing, incense and other things that you can buy uh, to make your uh, offerings. This is him now going into trance. So this is quite long, I'm not going to show you the whole thing, but we'll skip ahead. This guy's process of then going into trance looks somewhat similar to the other guy. He's got the same voluntary clonus of sort of shaking his leg. Uh, he, he sort of does a certain amount of swaying like this. He does this gesture. The differences are he does lots more head movements. He really shakes his head, and you'll see later, if I can show that part when he's in trance, he also does more kind of um, shaking of his head. And um, he doesn't do the vomiting at all. So even though on another day we went and saw five different shamans at a festival all getting possessed at the same time, and they all showed vomiting. So there's elements that are you know, commonly used by different people, but they're not all rigid. It's different people have their own version of this in effect. So, so. Uh, Anyway, once he's possessed, uh, he, you know, he was going really fast. They're shouting really intensely. 
that may have been also, I'm not quite clear on this episode, we haven't sort of collected all our notes, that at one point there was more than one God trying to possess him, so they were really, the people chanting were getting really emphatic to try to make sure that it was just the right God. Uh, and then he also jumps back up into the chair suddenly, and now he's possessed. They push the table forward, and he immediately starts, um, um, I think we can probably start with this one here, he immediately starts processing these things. And he just does thousands of these. And unlike the other guy, there were not that many people consulting on this day. So he was basically producing generic ones that they were putting in packets, saying good for headaches, good for, you know, uh, whatever. And they were making little packets. The other thing, the thing I wanted you to hear is that... See, he's possessed by a baby god. So you hear his voice. He's wearing a necklace with lots of pacifiers around his neck. That is um, an exotic practice from a Western point of view, right, or a North American point of view. However, we have our own forms of exoticism. And so this is a clip, again, taken from the web of somebody with uh, dissociative identity disorder describing his experience. So we'll just show you this briefly. So I think that gives you a couple of very striking illustrations of dissociative phenomena. Um, it probably raises some questions in your mind right away about what's going on uh, and is anything going on besides a very complex cultural script being played out. Uh, because in both cases you could say, okay, there's certain expectations. What is a donkey and what does it mean to be a healer and be possessed? And there's a model and there are templates, historical templates, and people for, by and large conform to those. Everybody around them also knows the template and everybody's contributing to a performance. So one view of these phenomena in fact argues that they are um, basically scripts, basically role-playing, if you will, prescribed by a culture. Uh, they may still have social functions and be valuable, but if you view it just as a role performance, then you may at least initially be less interested in whether there's some special psychological mechanism and so on. You, you just be asking maybe more, where does the script for this role come from? What does it mean socially, et cetera, et cetera. That's one view. And similarly for multiple personality disorder, you could say, well, there was at a certain point in time a widely known script uh, for multiple personality disorder. Uh, it implied that you could have many different personalities. Interestingly, in the 1800s and early 1900s, when there were just a few cases described, uh, it was understood as dual personality or co-consciousness, and there were usually only two personalities. Uh, but with the idea that there could be more and more, uh, we saw people appearing like this guy who, who uh, uh, has 53 different personalities. Um, and you could surely see the interaction, at least with a therapist, who had very clear ideas of what she was expecting and, in effect, what she was suggesting through her questions. These were not the first time she probably asked these questions, but, you know, when you say, is the five-year-old boy there, uh, you're also giving an idea as well as calling forth. And there are a lot of other ways in which she had built into her her, uh, her language uh, kinds of um, implicit suggestions, interrogative uh, suggestions. Um, so again, one view that sometimes might be called a skeptical view would say that all these phenomena are basically a kind of dramatic process, a kind of script that's followed in which a person can disavow control, disavow memory, uh, and uh, have this kind of uh, striking behavior. Um, the other view says, no, there's something special. In the case of the Don Key, there's something called trance. A person goes into trance, uh, and then they're able to do these things. And again, even within that view, there's a view at one poll that would say, okay, uh, trance is a state of intense absorption of attention and imaginative involvement, and a person can then play the role, but they play the role within trance, and so they experience it very differently. Uh, another view would say, actually, trance is a receptive state of mind, and the god is able to descend in that state. You know, that you could actually work within the religious framework and say, let's, let's grant the ontology that makes, you know, views these gods as real beings, and then you could still argue that, well, the, the donkey does have to do something to prepare himself, to cleanse himself and purify himself, to make himself receptive. 
Similarly, in the case of multiple personality disorder, there's a contrasting perspective to the pure role-playing perspective that says there is a particular kind of psychopathology in which a person's mind and self-representation and so on gets broken into different pieces or compartments and they can inhabit or live within a certain compartment and, and that compartment can be unaware of other compartments. And people talk about those compartments as persons. So you could have multiple persons and multiple experiences of the self and so on. So there are these different assumptions, different partial models. Nobody has a very well worked out complete model, I, was, I suppose, but uh, although the role playing model is fairly straightforward, so it's not hard to imagine how it's fairly complete. The other models I think are harder to work out in detail. Uh, but you see the tensions uh, and to some degree the polarization between these perspectives. And there's quite a lot at stake uh, because if you view it as a role, the implication is it should be relatively easy to change. It is a kind of pretend, uh, so it lacks a certain kind of uh, truth, if you will. Or, uh, and um, it, it's often used in a mode of kind of dismissing the reality of these experiences. If you think that, no, there is something special going on here and it's something called trance, then you're caught in trying to figure out, well, what is trance? What, you know, is there a biology? Is there a, something different in the brain? Is there uh, something that we can measure uh, going on in this context? Um, so this is the central problem I want to talk about uh, from a few different angles in terms of what we know from a research point of view and how we can use it to illuminate these phenomena. And, and just to anticipate a point we'll come back to, you also see in these two settings, in one case, trance phenomena that are part of a healing practice. They're not an illness. The donkey wants to go into trance, trains to be able to do it, and it's a success when he does it. Everybody's pleased that now the god can visit again, and there'll be a lot of benefit that everybody's going to get from this. Versus the other problem where it's unbidden, this person is not asking for this, and his life is being disorganized and disrupted as a result of these experiences of not being himself. The other parallel you can see is in both involve alterations of identity. But in one case, the change in identity is of now the person is a god, or is speaking, the voice that's speaking is the voice of the god. In the other case, the voice that's speaking is a sub-personality or another personality, often a fragment of his own personal history, the boy that he knew who died when he was young, or his own self when he was five years old, or another kind of self, uh, an angry part of him, or another gender, or something, all of which represent different facets of his identity or his personal history or other things that he's been affected by. So you could even argue, as I will, that there are more parallels between these things than differences if you think of multiple personalities being the form that these phenomena take in a very individualistic society in which what you're possessed by are fragments of your own personal history. And the other uh, dissociative phenomena being what you see in a more collectivist society where there is this pantheon of gods and other beings and they can come from the outside and inhabit you. What is common in both cases from a psychological point of view and what we mean by dissociation is some kind of functional alteration in the normal integration of memory, identity, and perception. So ordinarily, we weave together our memories so that we have a more or less continuous narrative of where we were yesterday and what we did this morning, what we did five minutes ago. We don't have big gaps where we say, I don't remember what I did. He describes uh, at one point being at a party and, pe and then not remembering it at all, and people saying, oh, I saw you at that party and having no memory. So there's this big gap in his own biographical narrative for that period of time. Similarly for the Don Key, who can say, well, how did it go this evening, kind of at the end, you know, because he wasn't, he wasn't there. Uh, and there are other kinds of alterations. I mentioned already the conversion symptoms. So a person who uh, says they're unable to move their arm, and yet you can't find anything wrong with their arm. So again, you could say there's some kind of lack of integration uh, in which something is happening uh, that in some sense you think ought to be under cognitive control, but the person doesn't have any control over that. So there's a kind of, again, partitioning. Uh, it's important that it's not due to any obvious neurological dysfunction. If you have paralysis and we can show, yes, you have a lesion to the opposite side of the brain where that is, is we know that that causes certain kind of paralysis, that's not what we mean by conversion symptom. Moreover, as I mentioned last time in talking about somatization, when a person has a conversion symptom, it usually follows their model of the problem, not the anatomical distribution. 
so a person, for example, may get numb and they get their entire hand numb instead of just the part of the hand that's uh, you know, uh, uh, innervated by a specific uh, set of nerves. Um, typically, you see these discontinuities, but there's also fluidity and plasticity that it can move around, it can shift, the tension can shift, and so on. Um, these phenomena are actually extremely, or at least the Don Key phenomena, the multiple personality is a little more rare, although there was a little epidemic in North America and some other parts of the world for a period of time. But the possession phenomena that you're seeing here, and, and other kinds of conversions, as I mentioned, and so on, are extremely common around the world, actually. So whatever we're looking at, it requires some kind of explanation, that it's some kind of uh, common human propensity to, to do these things. Uh, and there is, even though we can see at a fairly abstract level similarities, there's lots of specific variation. I mean, who you get possessed by, what it looks like to go into trance, what kind of music. People have, some people have theories that, oh, there's certain frequencies of sound, et cetera, et cetera. But it turns out it's extremely varied. It just depends on the musical tradition, on the context. There certainly are things like drumming and chanting and other rhythmic things that are used to focus people's attention but there's not much evidence that there's like a very specific frequency or certain something like that that is crucial for this process. It has mo much more to do with people's expectations of what's going to happen uh, than it does with any of the specificity. Uh, so in DSM, we have a group of dissociative disorders you know, with the idea that these are problems. And what are those problems? Well, the, the most basic one is dissociative amnesia. So somebody can't remember things. Um, so, for example, I saw a young woman brought to the emergency room by the police. She'd been found uh, sleeping in a car, uh, and she, uh, they woke her up inside the car, and she did not, could not explain how she got there, uh, who she was, uh, and so they brought her to the emergency room. Uh, and we were at a, you know, she had a good neurological workup, there was nothing we could find. Uh, and that we were going to hospitalize her because we couldn't send her home because she didn't know who she was. I mean, she had a wallet with some papers, but she didn't recognize that, and, and so we were kind of stuck. Uh, and so uh, at one point I decided uh, at the time uh, that um, maybe this was dissociative and maybe we could discover what was going on, and so I told her that maybe this was a stress reaction uh, and that we could use hypnosis for her to um, remember what was going on if she wanted. So she said, sure, she was game to do that. And so I did um, this exercise with her, which I could do with all of you right now if you would like, where I told her, well, let, first of all, I'd just like to help you get more comfortable. So you can, if you'd like, close your eyes and listen closely to what I'm saying. And all I'm going to suggest to you is that it's possible for you to get a little bit more comfortable than you are right now. Maybe in a little while you're going to find yourself really feeling just a little bit drowsy, your eyelids feeling kind of heavy, and you're just going to let yourself sink back into your chair deeper and deeper, more and more relaxed. And it really doesn't matter how relaxed you go, you can go just as relaxed as you'd like, because that's all you need to do right now. This is a chance for you to experience something a little bit different that you need to experience, that you can learn from, and it's completely safe and it's going to be completely familiar because you have many times in your own life gone very deeply relaxed, gone very deeply into your own mind, into your own thoughts, into your own reveries. And the deeper you go, the quieter it gets. And the quieter it gets, the more that you can listen to the sound of my voice. And I really don't know how deep you're going, but I do know that you can learn to go even deeper, so deep, you may be amazed to find, just floating down deeper and deeper with every breath. So that's the kind of thing I began doing with her, and as you've experienced here, with that invitation, in any group of people, you'll find a range of responses. In fact, you'll find a normal distribution with the average person getting a little bit absorbed and thinking, oh, this is interesting, this is a bit curious, and feel themselves getting drawn in. Some people saying, nah, what's going on here, nothing's happening. And some people getting lost very quickly, getting very, very deeply absorbed very quickly. So I'll tell you more about that in a moment. But that is called hypnotizability, and it's a stable personality trait. Uh, and as I say, it has a kind of normal distribution of the general population. 
So with this young woman, when I did that, and, I, and then I, she got very deeply absorbed very quickly, and I told her she could remember a time in the past when she was a child, when she was very comfortable, and it was a very warm summer day, and she was really enjoying having a cool treat, like an ice cream or a popsicle, and she could really, really taste that and feel that, and I could see from her face that she was really getting absorbed and enjoying it. So we just did something very pleasant with her. And then I said, and now in a little while, I'd like you to return to your usual waking state, and you're going to wake up, and we'll just talk about this. So that's what we did. So that was the first step, kind of, of making, building our little relationship in the emergency room in these first few minutes and showing her that we were going to do something and sort of demystifying it in a way. It's nothing very dramatic. It's really just remembering a childhood memory or imagining a childhood imagining very vividly. What was striking, and I think what I'll argue is relevant to this kind of case, is that she was very good at this. She got very deeply absorbed very quickly, unlike some of us who may have a hard time getting engaged either because we're vigilant, we're thinking like, no, this is the wrong setting, I, I don't, you know, this is not where I do that stuff, or we just in general find it harder to do. So there's both things going on, of course. Is, is it the right time and place? And how much does this kind of getting absorbed come, come easily to you? So then we did it a second time, and I said, this time, I, you know, uh, we're, we're going to, you know, uh, explore some things and see what we can re recover. And I told her, uh, both before and as we did this process again, that uh, it was likely that she would remember certain things, but she needed to know she didn't have to remember anything she didn't want to remember. Uh, and if there was anything she did remember that she didn't want to deal with later, that was fine too. She could put it aside and, and bring it out later. So this was all anticipating that maybe there's some traumatic thing that happened that she doesn't want to talk about and will, you know, it's part of protecting her and allowing her to control the, the rate at which we do things. And then I had to remember uh, something from a few weeks ago, and she started telling me that, and then we came a week ago, and then I said, and now you're thinking of yesterday, tell me what's happening. And she told me that she got a, a letter in the mail with a ticket, a summons to go to court for an enormous ticket, and she was very stressed. And she drove to visit her boyfriend, that they've been having a big fight, and she got to his house, and she discovered her best girlfriend's car in the driveway. And she knew that they were having an affair, the, the two of them. And she just started crying and fell asleep in the car, and when she woke up, she didn't remember who she was. So that is a kind of dissociative episode of amnesia uh, without a clear cultural context, although I have no idea what books or novels or she'd read or movies she'd seen beforehand that perhaps prepared her for this kind of response. Uh, but she also was highly hypnotizable. So she clearly had this ability to get deeply absorbed and perhaps that's related to the ability to compartmentalize memory and to have this kind of amnesia. And I told her uh, then before she was sort of coming out of this state of absorption that she could, if she'd like, remember everything that we talked about, but she could put it away if she didn't want to. If she did remember everything we talked about, it was clear that she had some things she had to work on, and I would make sure that she would have help and support to deal with that. So she decided she did remember everything. She came out. We talked about referring her to a mental health clinic for crisis support, and she, we saved a hospitalization of somebody who otherwise would have been hospitalized at least for a while while everybody scratched their head and said, what's going on with this woman, until perhaps her memory came back spontaneously, as I suspect, I suspect it would have. So this illustrates a couple of things, but mainly uh, it helps us to both see the phenomenology of this kind of acute, limited amnesia, dissociation, how other people getting involved, starting from the police saying, who are you, in kind of this awkward situation, and, and her sort of reinforcing this sense of she doesn't know who she is, kind of stabilizes that state, perhaps, and then how the hip ritual of hypnosis and all the suggestions built into that was something that allowed her to use this ability to get deeply absorbed and to reframe it as a, a way of coping and, and, and going forward. So that's dissociative amnesia, and you could think of that uh, as a kind of core phenomena that we're trying to understand and see how that might be related to these other things. If, in the course of having that amnesia, you wake up and you adopt a new identity, because you wake up in a new place. I mean, I saw another patient years ago, uh, years later, who uh, had, had an episode where he woke up in Atlantic City uh, having uh, gambled away a lot of his money uh, and didn't know how he got there and what he did. So that's an example then of a fugue. So you have the amnesia, but then you have the running away to a new place. And as I mentioned last time, the philosopher Ian Hacking wrote a whole book about fugue called Mad Travelers and how in the late 1800s in France, fugue became more frequent uh, and became a popular topic of study by several French psychiatrists who were fascinated by this phenomena and wrote books of case series of these and became well-known experts and so had many cases referred to them. And he argues that this actually was part of increasing the frequency 
of fugue because it became this object of medical interest and medicine in a way legitimated this process and that he argues that it emerged and became popular at that moment in time for a variety of reasons including the increase of train travel and mobility and people coming back from the uh, from the military who had had already some experience of travel and that um, people who had, would not have seen uh, fleeing to somewhere else as being a viable solution to stresses or difficulties in the past had it available as an option. Interesting question as to what, again, what extent does this operate consciously in people's minds and to what extent could it operate non-consciously in a sense. And I say non-consciously, not unconsciously, to reserve the possibility that there are many kinds of non-conscious processes and the unconscious as described by Freud is one kind of such process of things that could potentially be remembered and that are being uh, repressed in a way. Dissociation implies another set of ways of organizing memory that may not involve repression, but might involve compartmentalization and other ways that we will talk about. Dissociative identity disorder, which is the new term for, um, for multiple personality disorder, um, uh, partly to avoid the imputation that there must be separate personalities to sort of broaden the idea that these are dissociations in and of identity, but they could take different forms, um, is the most extreme dissociative disorder in the sense that it involves uh, profound shifts and multiple different states potentially and can be very disruptive in people's lives. And I mentioned also, I think, that we had in the, uh, fr from, from the late 1800s when there were a few cases described of people with dual consciousness, uh, and these became celebrated cases to the extent that they were taken around on the stage uh, throughout North America, interviewed by psychologists publicly, and as a fascinating phenomenon that people could show this kind of shift in attention, uh, shift, shift in identity in this dramatic way. Uh, from that early period, and, and people like uh, um, William James and so on were very interested in, in these phenomena because they felt it could teach us something very fundamental about human consciousness. Until the 1940s, there were very few cases in the world literature, really a handful of cases in the entire world literature. In the uh, 1940s, 1950s, um, uh, Hervey and uh, Cleckley published a book called Three Faces of Eve, uh, in which they described uh, a woman who had multiple personalities. This got made into a movie uh, and uh, became part of popular culture. From the late 60s, particularly into the 70s and 80s, there was an exponential increase in the number of people with multiple personality. So we had this explosion of cases. And not only many, many cases, and people see uh, some psychiatrists who saw like 100 cases of multiple personality, whereas previous generations, people could be a clinician their entire life and never see a single case. Uh, so something had changed, in, apparently, in, in, in how people were expressing distress or how people were accessing help, how, how they were being interpreted. Um, uh, and also a shift, as I mentioned already, from just a very few personalities to many personalities being reported. So a kind of reshaping of this phenomenon. And I'll, I'll say a bit more about that in a moment again. Uh, and then the other category we have here is depersonalization. Depersonalization, derealization, alterations in a person's sense of reality and of themselves. So again, this is probably the most common of all the things I've listed. Probably most people have had an episode of this at some point in their life where they suddenly feel like uh, things don't feel real, or I don't feel like my usual self. Um, I recall an experience I had when I was under a lot of stress where I felt like this is all a dream. I really feel like this is all a dream. I'm, I'm just sure I'm going to wake up. You know, just that funny feeling uh, like that. So that's an example of what we mean by depersonalization, derealization. Uh, so that's also considered associative phenomenon. As I say, it's the most common uh, of these kinds of phenomena. And then, as I mentioned before, there are always these residual categories where most people fit because they don't have all the symptoms and quite the form that's being described. So that's what DSM lists. These are what ICD-10 lists, the international classification. You notice it has more categories, and that's because of the influence of psychiatrists from other parts of the world who say, but actually these are very common phenomena. We see this all the time, and we see different varieties, and we need some scheme, even though a lot of this is not pathology. A lot of it, this, as we already saw, is, is normal religious practice, healing practices, other things we do still see problematic uh, events 
even within that context. So in Brazil, for example, where people take part in um, Afro-Brazilian healing cults like Candomblé, where people are, uh, again, possessed by gods, and that's not just the healer, that's all the congregants really try to get possessed by a god, uh, and you follow a certain expected process in that, and it's you know, a positive experience if you get possessed. But on some occasions, there's somebody who, when it's time not to be possessed anymore, doesn't come out of it or whose behavior when they are possessed is totally erratic and not, doesn't follow any of the accepted scripts and norms. And those people may be brought to the emergency room, uh, you know, uh, saying, you know, we did the, the healing thing and, uh, or the religious practice and they, they're out of control, there's something wrong. And so they'll be uh, treated in the emergency context there. So there's a need for uh, other categories. The other thing that ICD does, that DSM, did not do was to recognize conversion symptoms, these somatic symptoms of loss of muscle control, loss of sensory function, and so on, as another kind of dissociative phenomenon. I've sort of implied that, and we have been talking here because that's how I think of it, but officially in the classification in DSM, the conversion symptoms are somatoform symptoms, not dissociative symptoms. But most people believe that the mechanism underneath is going to be similar to these other phenomena, and so it makes sense to group these things uh, together. Trance and possession disorders exist in ICD, not in DSM. In DSM, they're in an appendix as a possible thing to be included uh, in DSM-4, at least. So what are the dimensions of dissociation? Uh, perceptual alterations. People can lose a whole perceptual function, be blind or deaf. Uh, they can also have um, uh, hallucinations. Uh, or have other kinds of experiences. Um, again, there's some very common kinds, mild perceptual distortions, uh, which we can raise the questions whether they're on a continuum with these things. Um, I had a, a patient years ago who told me that there's a certain painting she couldn't look at because she was convinced that the painting was looking at her and, and the eyes were moving and it was watching her and so on. So that feeling of just a small perceptual distortion could be on a continuum with these other phenomena, and certainly it's a much more common experience than some of the things we're talking about. So, you, I mean, you're, just, you're, at, you're raising a very important question in terms of, it sounds like aspects of dissociation, we start talking about perceptual distortions and so on, it's uh, hallucinations, it sounds like this is similar to some of the symptoms and experiences that you find in psychotic illnesses. Uh, so what is the difference? Well, first of all, to say the similarity you're noticing is there and it's real and it's a real dilemma. Uh, because to the extent that these are different phenomena, it becomes a diagnostic problem sometimes of sorting that out. And particularly in a context like North America where dissociative phenomena are considered rare and so are not really considered very much by many clinicians. So if somebody reports that they're seeing gods in front of them or the gods speaking to them, the most likely category that a clinician would use uh, is this is a psychotic illness. Uh, and it's, I think the part of the, I, I would say that's changed somewhat in recent years precisely because, and this is one of the positive effects of paying much more attention to dissociative phenomena, so that clinicians at least consider the possibility that there's an alternative explanation. Um, how you distinguish between the two is complicated. Uh, there are qualitative differences in some ways. Uh, so you can look at certain kinds of um, features. Typically, dissociative phenomena follow a script. So the person's having, seeing or hearing something that is sort of expected, uh, and it takes a particular form. So when someone has a very bizarre and strange experience that doesn't fit anything, then we think, okay, that's more likely psychosis. Um, Typically, even though people say there's no voluntary control, you can see it's malleable. You can see it's responding to social contingencies. So again, that's a clue. Uh, as I mentioned, you can use something like hypnosis or suggestion in other contexts, and typically these phenomena are extremely malleable. So if you have the right um, authority to, to speak, let's say, if the person's possessed by a god and you have the right authority to speak to the god, you'll see an immediate effect from that. Whereas again, with some kinds of psychotic symptoms, depending on how disorganized the person is, you may not see that you have any effect. 
With many kinds of psychosis, there are other dysfunctions, and that's a big part of what we look for is there, in case of schizophrenia, is there other evidence of thought disorder or other things that show us there's something else going on. Um, with, well, I'll, I'll say more as we go along, but just to say that it is not always easy distinction to make. Sometimes it just takes time that we look at over time. There's a study years ago by German um, in Uganda looking at a, a people who present with sort of acute psychoses and following them up over a period of six months. And of that group of people, one third of them went on to have something like schizophrenia, one third of them went on to have something like bipolar disorder, and well, I'm being very rough about these figures, but anyway, another group of them went on uh, to have acute psychotic episodes that resolved completely. And we don't know to this day, I think, well enough for, in terms of international work, those acute psychotic illnesses that resolve completely are they, in fact, same kind of psychotic illness that could go on to be schizophrenia or could go on to be a full-blown bipolar disorder that is resolving? Or are they, are they something else entirely? Or are they dissociative phenomena? Because those we would expect, in most cases, are going to resolve, uh, at least the episode is going to resolve completely. Yes, and because dissociation uh, of the, all the kinds we're talking about is transient, it is short-lived. Nobody spends days or years or months. They may, they may go in and out of things, but they don't spend it continuously in this kind of state. That's also a clue as to what's going on here. I mean, why can somebody not be possessed by the God 24-7, week after week? Uh, it's just probably too much cognitive effort. Um, we, we have a recent paper in Psychiatric Services that looks at a series of patients seen in our cultural consultation service where there was a change in the diagnosis of psychosis. Mm -hmm. um, so we're raising, because we find a significant number of cases who refer to us with psychosis, where we decide in the end, no, they were not psychotic. And one of the reasons is we decide in the end, actually, this was dissociative. Uh, and the other dilemma, though, is that schizophrenia or other psychotic illness and dissociative disorder are not mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. So in a context where dissociation is very prevalent, uh, either as a model that you see because it happens a lot in religious practices or you yourself have experienced in some other place. If you also get sick with depression, with schizophrenia, with anything else, you could well have dissociative symptoms on top of that, which really complicates the presentation because then maybe there are parts of what, what you're doing or behaving that are extreme, very extreme and they're actually not the core illness, but they're the dissociative. We had an example of somebody from, the, uh, uh, from part of Africa, I think from Ethiopia, uh, or uh, Somalia in the emergency room at one point who was very psychotic and was throwing themselves against the wall repeatedly. And it was you know, a very unusual kind of presentation. And the thought in the end was that you know, there was part of the psychotic illness that was identifiable as something like schizophrenia, but the person was also showing a kind of dissociative behavior that in a way conveyed from her own subjective point of view, just how ill and how, how, much, how much she was suffering. And, but it's easily misinterpreted by people who are not familiar with that mode of expressing things. So, uh, and it also, I guess, the fundamental point of this malleability is such that uh, this is the area where people can take on cultural models very easily. Um, and it's open to suggestion. Uh, you know, if, if somebody expects that they should be possessed by yet another god, you know, that may call that God forward. Or that somebody expects that there's a famous um, uh, 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 case of a, um, a guy called Kenneth Bianchi, the hillside strangler, who was a serial murderer and whose defense uh, in court was that he had multiple personality and it wasn't him who did it, it was one of the other personalities. Raises complex issues in terms of law and so on. Should he be allowed to say, don't put me in prison, just put the other one in prison? You know, and how do you do that? Uh, but and as part of his trying to address his defense, uh, they brought in a famous uh, psychiatrist, psychologist, Martin Orn, who was a, a very important figure in hypnosis research. And Martin Orn uh, tried to show through interviewing uh, Kenneth Bianchi that he was making it up. He was not really multiple personality. He was pretending to be multiple personality. Now, that's an argument you can only make if you don't accept the role theory. If you say it's not just a role, there really is something that happens in multiple personality. So you could have somebody who's pretending to be multiple personality and somebody who really is multiple personality. So you have to have a different theory already of multiple personality to allow for that possibility. Uh, and what he did, among other things, with Kenneth Bianchi was he, and you can see this is a film called, it was shown, I think, on BBC years ago, a documentary called The Mind of a Murderer. 
Uh, and what he does is at one point he interviews him and he says, you know, it's very strange that you only have uh, two personalities or three. I don't remember how many he had at that point. Because uh, with multiples, there's almost always three or four. He just makes this up, you know, and he tells it to him. And lo and behold, the next day another personality comes out. So, and Orn takes this as evidence. You see, he's really faking. I have to say, I don't think that was a strong argument on Orn's own, argue, or own view of this thing, because if you say it's dissociative, it's also highly suggestible. It doesn't mean it's a real phenomenon, uh, not a real phenomenon. So it could be a real phenomenon, and you can get more, more of these things going by suggestion. So even though I was a bit puzzled by Orn sort of claiming that he now had shown something, Orn was also a person who developed a whole other thing called trans logic, where he tried to show that there were certain ways people thought in trance that were different than how they thought in everyday life. Milton Erickson tried to do that too, where he argued that when people were in trance, their attention was very coned down. So if he asked them to do certain tasks, they would not really pay attention to the larger context. As simple as he would ask a person, okay, here's a painting, where would you put it in this room? And people who were sort of wide awake and alert would say, well, you know, in the middle of that wall there, they would pick some, you know, they'd look at the whole room and they'd pick a space and balance it where somebody who was really absorbed would just pick some inappropriate place sort of in their narrow cone of vision. And so these were attempts to get at what is intrinsic to trance, which as you see in the end is fairly subtle. It's not like it's a totally different thing. It's just, well, okay, the person's attention is kind of narrowed down a bit. And so we're going to show that somehow. So this is still an ongoing challenge to characterize what, if anything, is unique to the, the, this, these processes. Um, so we've already mentioned perceptual alterations, alterations of motor control or volition. I mean, in hypnosis, another thing that we do sometimes people is we'll tell people, um, you can, if you'd like, have an experience right now. Why don't you all do this? You put your arm out in front of you. Just let, put your arm there. Okay, that's good. Now, I'd like you to imagine that there's a balloon attached to your finger, and it's filled with helium. Really try to picture that. Maybe it may help you to close your eyes. doesn't matter. However, just really try to picture it. And imagine it's a huge balloon. It's huge, and it's tugging. It's pulling up on your arm. It's pulling up. Imagine it pulling up, and just wait to see what happens. Just really try to feel that. Maybe you can feel the string around your finger, and you can feel that balloon. It's pulling your arm up and up and up. Oh yes, starting to go, that's right, starting to float right up. That's good. Just enjoy that, it's a curious feeling. Just let yourself go with that. That's very good. That's very good. Now maybe some of you feel it's getting heavier and your arm is just dropping down. That's okay too. Just wait and see. But those of you who are imagining that balloon and feel it getting lighter and lighter, you can just wait and see. Okay. So this is, a, again, a hypnotic suggestion. And so again, you, if you do this in a group, you'll find that some people, as you were doing, some people start having a little bit of rising of their hand. Right? I also added into this what's called kind of permissive suggestions, which are very good for highly individualistic uh, people who are anxious <laughs> about authoritative control, where you say, maybe your arm's getting heavier. So generally speaking, this is the style of hypnosis that Milton Erickson taught, where you try to cover every possibility, because the point is not to get into a power struggle with the person who's suggesting things, but to get absorbed. And so you just try to make every way another way to get absorbed. But in any event, go back to this thing, which is used in hypnotic susceptibility tests. Basically, a hypnotic susceptibility test just gives you a bunch of these things, and it scores how well you do on each of them. And again, you get this normal distribution. If, gave, if I gave you 100 tests or 10 tests, you would get a normal distribution. So some people will actually have their arm floating up, and they will not experience it as they're doing it. It's, what's doing it is the image. right? The, constructing the image is starting to have this influence. You can tell people, I'd like you to imagine that your hand's getting warm, and some people, their hands will get warm, and so on. Um, so there's an alteration of volition. Of, of, of experience, of, of whether you experience yourself as controlling things or them just happening. And uh, that's something that can happen with hypnosis or with dissociation. Imagery and imagination, I've already mentioned, that people can get very absorbed and, and have vivid imagery in some ways. That's not essential. It's not the only way to do this. It really depends on what the task is and what you're doing. And people differ in what they find easy. Even with imagery, some people find certain modalities easier than others. Some people can do visual imagery or smell or taste or whatever. Uh, you can ask people to imagine sucking on a lemon, and you do that, and you'll see some people in the room will really get that effect. You know, it's because in effect, it's like having a vivid memory. So you're calling up that memory to the extent that you're actually having some 
of the uh, sensory effect. And typically in clinical hypnosis, you try to find the things people can do well and let them have that experience and then you link it to the ones that they're trying to have, like they want pain control or they want something else. So you let them build on their feeling of success so they feel competent. And of course also it's about normalizing and demystifying it because hypnosis per se is a cultural category we have for this kind of process of getting absorbed, getting engaged. And it has a lot of bad rep because the main way in which hypnosis appears for most people is in stage hypnosis and in the sort of Svengali Trilby myth of the idea that another person is going to somehow control you and make you do silly things or embarrassing things. So that's what people feel very threatened about. They feel that's going to happen to them or they feel they're going to be only, the only people who can do this are people who are gullible, you know, who are just sort of uh, uncritical and, and, and so on. So they feel it's like a point of honor to show that I can rebut everything you're saying and I'm not going to go with it. But if you sort of tell people, but isn't this what you do when you're reading a really good novel and, you know, they're describing this beautiful island in the tropics and you start really feeling like you're there. And so much so maybe somebody walks into the room and there's a moment before you notice that they were there. So that's not a bad thing. That's a, a skill, a talent you have. So why not learn to use that in other contexts where it could be helpful to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. The, the anthropologist Jeffrey Snodgrass is going to publish an article next year. We have, we're having an issue of our journal next year on cultures of the internet. And he's done work on people who are intensively involved in a massive uh, uh, you know, m multiple, whatever it is, online games, you know, multiple player on, online games, role playing games like World of Warcraft. Uh, and they're people who are intensely involved in these things, become a big part of their lives and their social worlds. Uh, and they describe different reasons for doing it. And one reason, one mode of doing it is absorption. The people feel, I just get so immersed and so involved, I lose you know, uh, the, the sense of time and the passage of the sense of time, or you're in this alternative time that's in the world that you're in and so on. So that's a capacity we all have. And I think it's been there for a long time. It's what we use to listen to stories imaginatively. It's what we use to concentrate. Uh, somebody who's a performer, who's a, you know, a, a pianist or whatever, gets lost in their music. Rock climbers, people who do things that require intense con concentration will all describe these experiences. So that's at least part of what we're talking about here. I mean, it, probably there's more than one dimension, more than one aspect that's coming together in these performances. But that ability to really concentrate intensely and get absorbed. In fact, there is a, a, a scale called the Telegant Absorption Scale that essentially measures that. It, it says, have you ever stood before a sunset and just you know, got lost in the feeling of the sunset? And, and it asks a bunch of these common experiences. And again, if you do this, you find a distribution in the population. Everybody has some of these. Most of us have you know, a moderate number, and some people have enormous numbers of these. And if you have a lot of these, you're prone to have more and you're prone to respond to certain situations in a powerful way. So come back to this issue of the donkey and getting possessed or somebody trying to learn to do that. If you're at the high end of something like absorption, you may well very easily have some of the experiences that people are trying to teach you to have or encouraging you to have, where you get totally lost and absorbed in the sound and the chant and, and the involvement and the setting. Um, I think it's about time for us to take a break here. I think we've sort of lost track of the passage of time because everybody's very absorbed. Yeah.